welcome folks to the Stillmaker event here. With little more than a video camera and a microphone, documentary filmmaker Melody Gilbert has taken her audiences on some pretty diverse journeys. From the light and quirky Married at the Mall to the gut-wrenching films Whole and A Life Without Pain. She's taken time off from promoting her most recent film, Urban Explorers Into the Darkness, to stop by and visit us here at Butter City. Melody, thanks for coming out. Thanks for having me. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, you've got four documentaries behind you, and uh, I'd like to kind of go back to the beginning and kind of see, like, where you started out. Talk about kind of how you got in the business and what your, how your career started off. Well, I've actually I've been in the business for a really, really long time, like more than 20 years, because I came out of the news business. I actually worked in TV news for many years. And that's where I learned how to tell stories using visuals. I was a video storyteller for a long time. It was just short things, so, you know, minute 30. Were you editing or you... Um... Oh, I did, you know, at the beginning you do everything. You know, you shoot, you edit, and actually I didn't do much shooting. The cameras were too big. So um, I always had like, you know, camera guy. Um, but uh, I kind of, so that's my background. I came out of news and while I was working in uh, news, I ended up kind of moving into the um, special projects units and doing investigative work or documentaries or anything I'd get my hands on that was outside of daily news. And that's kind of how I learned how to make docs. But you're kind of I doing... didn't go to film school. Yeah, well I you didn't. did. You kind of did that your own film school. My own way, yeah. 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 Uh, I mean, those stories are probably no more than two to five minutes? Uh, no, the real news story was a minute 30. That was a minute 20 when I first started. Then it was like minute 30, and sometimes toward the end it was like a minute. So I'm sure that you were doing your best to get you know the most out of you, you could out of a story, but now you're doing feature length stories. Right. I mean, what things did you have to abandon or what skills did you feel like you had to develop in order to get into documentary? Well, I, no, I always thought it was actually, it's much harder to do a story in a minute 20. If you can do that, it's easy to do more. So if you can t have a beginning, middle, and end in a minute 20, then you're good for, for a feature. You just, you just, you don't really have to abandon anything. You just grow it. It's right. great. It's wonderful. How did it's, you... and, I, and I hated going out on news stories after a while because, you know, you'd show up there with like a crew and you, know, you go in and you ask a few questions like, as soon as it started getting good, got to go because you got a deadline. It has to be on the air that night. And people would just start opening up or as soon as you turn the camera off and the camera guy goes into the car, you know, then the juicy stuff happened. And I was like, oh, if I could just stay a little longer or come back tomorrow. Is that kind of so, what motivated you to go into? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Dance. I mean, I always wanted to do mo more, but I couldn't. And then, of course, when the cameras got a little bit smaller and uh, I could do it on my own, that's when I started doing about six, seven years ago, I started doing it on my own. It was great. How did that transition happen? Did you just, just put down the mic one day and said, I'm going to start doing docs? No, I was or? teaching in between. Ah, um, okay. After I, I basically left TV news, daily TV news, which I worked in for a long time all over the country, and uh, went into teaching. I taught at the U for about seven years in the journalism school. But while I was doing that, I started thinking, I have a lot more things I need to do for myself. And um, so over time, I just decided to do it. It was kind of a little crazy. I just kind of up and left the U one day. Oh, and, really? Uh, oh, yeah. I, just, like, I think back what I did is ridiculous. But I got it done. So, And, and when you said I've made four independent uh, documentaries, they are truly, I mean, I've done them pretty much myself. Um, those four, but I have made other documentaries, but they weren't mine. So, like WCCO would hire me or uh, to make a. I, I remember I made a documentary called Class of 2000. It was about four, uh, nine um, high school students that we followed for four years, but it wasn't mine. Oh, I see. It belonged to CCO. So my whole thing was I wanted to make things that were mine. Well, okay. Well, let's take a trip down memory lane and look at some of your old stuff from Wisconsin. Oh, gee, from Wausau. Yeah. Newsline 9 Morning Edition, the most informative and current report of what's happening today. Good morning, I'm Melody Gilbert for Newsline 9's Morning Edition. Finally, some super winter weather is here. It'll be warm enough today and throughout the weekend to enjoy being outdoors. It's beginning to look a lot like Wisconsin could become a site for a nuclear waste dump. A Kiwani man has pleaded guilty to a fatal shooting in a Plover parking lot. Bone chilling temperatures are making a comeback. I'll be back with details about the weather in just a minute. Newsline 9's Melody Gilbert has the story. If you're like a lot of people, you may have spent much of this Christmas Eve on the road, driving to your ultimate destination. 
If you happen to pass through Nielsville on your way, you may have noticed police officers pulling over several cars with out-of-state license plates. City of Nielsville would like to give you a Christmas present. Instead of giving them a ticket, the drivers get a box full of goodies from Wisconsin, including some cheese, of course. One driver who was pulled over told me he thought the gift box giveaway was a good idea. He said in this thoughtless world we live in today, it's nice to know some people still care. Melody Gilbert, Newsline 9, Nielsville. If you've never tried snowmobiling before, now's your chance. For the next two weeks, manufacturers will be offering free rides so anybody can try this sled and see what it's like. So come on up to the North Woods and give snowmobiling a chance. Come up to It was just after 11 o'clock yesterday morning when dispatcher Barbara Benz answered a 911 call. On the other end was Dennis Cherney of Wisconsin Rapids. His wife, he said, was having a baby. Dang cool. Okay, has her water broken? Yes. An ambulance was called to the scene, but it broke down along the way. Another one was sent out, but in this case, the stork beat the ambulance. Heads out, heads out, heads out. Okay, get down there, get down there. Hold the baby's head up. Tell her to push, push. with the next contraction. Now, push with the next contraction, honey. It's out, it's out. It's out, okay. Up the sweep the baby's mouth out. What should I do? What should I do? Have him sweep the baby's mouth out and rub the back, rub the soles of the baby's feet and rub his back. Okay, rub the back, rub the baby's soles and sweep the mouth out with his fingers. He's, he's breathing. He's breathing. Oh, we don't put, yeah. Very good, he sounds great. It's a boy. It's a boy, congratulations. And at Riverview Hospital today, the proud parents were grateful for the help from a stranger. That was really comforting, uh, knowing that there was a third party there who knew what they were doing here. You know, yeah. obviously very amateurs at this. Dennis and Laurel named their second son Simon, but they say his nickname will undoubtedly be Speedy. Melanie Gilbert, Newsline 9, Wisconsin Rapids. That's all for now. Thanks for joining me. Have a great day. Classic stuff. Great okay. hair. Okay, painful, painful, painful to look at, honestly. I thought the stuff when you were on the snowmobile was going to for sure be like a clip from America's Funny Home <laughs> Videos. You're just going to bam right into something. It was before wireless microphones. That so, was a nice... you know, I had to throw it and we practiced a couple times and it actually worked. That guy was actually filming and he caught it at the same time, which is pretty good. Wow, was there someone else driving for him? No, he was, it, the, my cameraman that day was a very talented guy. Very but, safe. The, you know, the interesting thing is when I look at that, it reminds me again how much, I mean, I don't mind, you know, doing stand-ups. I didn't mind doing, having my voice on stories. But even back then, the uh, hair? It, it, beside the hair, um, but even back then it was driving me crazy because I always felt like people could tell the stories better than I could. And that was really the beginning. I mean, that's, you know... 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago. Um, I'm not a mathematician, but that would make you four. Uh, yeah, Klaus, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, anyway. Um, but the point is that um, I always felt that uh, if a little uncomfortable in that role of being sort of the star of the story. Right. And I remember even back in Wausau that I would ask the news director, can we just do like a montage of people, you know, like at State Fair, instead of having me do the stand up and me be the important part. And uh, it was unheard of. Nobody did that kind of thing. And I couldn't figure out how to do that. Like, how do you tell story? And that's my films now, all are people telling the stories themselves. I don't do voiceover. Right. I'm not in it you unless I have to be, voice. rarely hear me unless for the story it has to be in yeah. there. But I mean, it started even back then. I mean, this was a great way to kind of be trained to tell stories, but cripes that hair. Oh, <laughs> God. You can tell, I mean, in your movies, once in a while you hear your voice. I think I saw you in a mirror once. Oh, in, that's in bad. A shot. You shouldn't have even seen me in the mirror, but yeah. But it was, um... Yeah, I try to stay out of it. I mean, well, I you just seem reluctant. The yeah. Yeah. You know, I don't like um, to be in it. I mean, the point is to let the people tell their stories. And I, I it, it's a challenge because you have to do things differently. You have to ask questions a different way. You have to um, sort of pre-produce a lot of things in your head knowing that. I mean, if you can do... I, I tell my students a lot because I'm teaching again uh, quite frequently. But I, I tell my students, if you can do that, that's the hard way. The easy way is to write a voiceover and, yeah. you know, know in advance what you want to say or have you to kind of help people guide them through a story with your voiceover. But if the people tell the story themselves, it's much more challenging. Well, I was reading an interview that you did when you were down at South by Southwest. I think it was for Hole, and someone asked you, would you want to do narrative films? And uh -huh. you said, 
I can't imagine telling people what to say. Yeah, oh, that's so true. What, well, I don't remember that interview, but yeah, that's so true. I, it, 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 the best stories that happen are the ones that you can't possibly make up. You cannot write the lines. When I go back and I, and I actually transcribe my documentaries afterwards, which you have to do if they're going to be on broadcast, which most of my films end up um, internationally being broadcast, which is kind of how I've made my living. Like Butter City. Yeah, just like, it could be, it could be. We're, we'll, we'll work with you on that. We'll get you an agent. Um, but um, when I see the script afterwards, it's because it becomes a script, I think there's no way anybody could make this stuff up. Yeah. No way. Well, like the stories in um, your first independent doc that you did, Married at the Mall. Yeah. About oh, uh, I love that. the it, love stories. Yeah, in there. yeah. And the truckers, you know, and yeah. the way they had their exes. They were kind of involved with each other almost before they really got going. That's a great little story and their two-year-old son, I mean, it's just kind of a... Um... Yeah, I mean, what's, what's, um, I also like to make films that make people, uh, I don't like to necessarily give answers, which I think a lot of times in documentaries people expect that, but I like to kind of start out with a premise that would be like, that make you think something differently than, than you really get. Sure. So, you think automatically, first thing is, why would anybody want to get married at a mall? Yeah. Right? How tacky, how awful, yeah. how cheesy. <laughs> and then, during, as you watch the film, you know, my hope is that you go through the journey I went through, which is, well, why wouldn't you want to get married at a mall? <laughs> and look how fabulous these people are and how interesting they are and, and the, the layers come out of mm -hmm. that. So I try to kind of get past what you would sort of expect. And you're putting these stories together yourself. Yeah, I do, well, in Married at the Mall, I did virtually everything. Shot, um, edited, produced, direct, everything. Um, and actually, Whole and A Life Without Pain, my, all three films, I pretty much do it myself. I have had help on post-production with editing um, on uh, a couple of those films. I can't remember if it was all of them. But um, I work with uh, Charlie Gershewski at Channel Z, and uh, he's been great with post-production, and, and they've been very generous with their time. And w the new film, Urban Explorers, which I think we'll talk about another time, has actually been edited from scratch with them, which has been a completely different experience. Oh. So, but those other films, I basically conceive, produce, edit, you know, do everything myself, which is you know something I probably couldn't do if I hadn't come out of the news background. Which, you know, again in news, I learned how to do all of that stuff. You know, yeah. and it's uh, been a very nice transition. I really like it. Well, we have some clips from, from Married at the Mall, and I'd like to take oh, a look at these. which one are you showing? We're showing the trucker story. Oh, I love them. So I'd love to take a look, take a look at this and then come okay. back and kind of talk about kind of sure. where you've learned since, okay. since the right. production of okay. this one. So let's yeah, take a look at it. Yeah, this was the first, first independent film I made. Cool. Go to the chapel and we're gonna get married. Go to the chapel and we're gonna get married. You Ping and John are being married now in the Chapel of Love here at the Mall of America, and, and uh, we're having so much fun. You so answer by saying, I do. I do. Well, there always seems to be a big fascination with the Chapel of Love just because you can get married in a mall. I can't believe people really get married here. Wow. <laughs> it's really exciting. I mean, I would love to be in there. Sure, it's Mall of America, but come on, I would not want to get married here. I figured that people were going to, like shoppers were going to be walking in and <laughs> being like, oh, look, you know, and sitting down, and that didn't happen. <laughs> so I think people are a lot of times very curious what kind of a person gets married here. People just like you and me. I've been truck driver for 12 years. Oh, yeah, PDQ, he's going to come out the truck exit. Out here is a lifestyle. It's not everybody can do it. It gets hard some days. Is, some days are rough. You know, you're with each other 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Peter and I have known each other for 12 years. I'm marrying my best friend. Take a large glass of ice water and some cream, too, if I could. No problem. My name's Kim Hoffman. This is our son, Brendan Hoffman. At two years old, he's seen more of the United States than most people will ever think of seeing. Where's your nene? Well, she was going out with one of my best friends, and I always liked her. I always thought she was cute. <laughs> 
and so I just kind of fell in love with her when she started running with me. I think it was special because we were friends. Long before. Long we before. Long before. We were all best friends. His ex and my ex. Our wedding's going to be so simple. It's just going to be Marvin and Julie and Pete and I. Oh, we won't let nobody else come because then it was a fight. Who is going to come? It, and a lot of our friends drive for Marvin, so, you know, we got six trucks. Not all six trucks can be sitting in Minneapolis. Sure do appreciate it. Just come out of the TA. Kim CB Handle, which is Mad Shopper. What better place for Mad Shopper to get married than in all of America? Ah, I love that story. Very touching. I think uh, my favorite shot from that clip is the... The foreground cigarette smoke with the kid kind of in back yawning. I mean, it, it kind of tells a lot about what's happening there. And you, you have a lot of cutaways mm -hmm. kind of covering your butt, really giving you a lot of options to put the story together the way you wanted to. Another thing I learned from news, you, and, and actually, um, the most memorable moments of probably all my films are cutaways. And because they give a film texture, they're, um, they really tell you what's in the room or what is happening at that time that doesn't come from a person talking. And I love that. And yeah. so I put a lot of things, like even in interviews, I put things in the foreground or um, cutaways is to me everything. I mean, that was a great example of that. Yeah. Well, I remember in Life Without Pain, which we'll show some clips from later in another show. I know that a lot of times when you see the kids, you see them going through these, these very difficult times and there's toys in the foreground yeah. constantly reminding us that these are children exactly. going through this. Right. I mean, it really stays in the forefront. Yeah. But so, I love those people. I mean, I just, I... They're so happy. They're so happy. And everyone in the film, you know, that you meet at first, I mean, I, again, I just, I feel like that's what's fun about this is in the end, you're kind of, there's so many peop people in that film that I just, you, you kind of think, well, it's so nice to not worry about sort of the napkins or the yeah. matchbook covers or who's going to come to your wedding. These people are just love each other. And, you know, I actually stood up for some of the weddings. Like, they were only, they would come there and they would, you have to have a witness. Mm -hmm. And it was just two people like madly in love and they didn't have a witness so I had to be their witness a couple <laughs> times so but that, that took a year and I learned a lot that was the first film I shot myself and I learned a lot by um, doing all the camera work and I had a lot of problems with audio I usually work with a wireless microphone so it's constantly like pulling out the wireless mic and then trying to figure out you know who is on which mic. I mean it was a huge learning experience and I shot for a year at the chapel um, and then as I was shooting, I was also, also editing it. So toward the end, you know, I kind of put it all together and um, then, then we showed that and it's been really fun. So it's an interesting transition, so. Well, yeah, and it seems, it does seem very much seem like a, like a longer version of a human interest piece. Yeah. It seems to naturally transition out of your news yes, background. Yeah. I mean. Yeah, I get, accu I get accused of that actually a lot. You know, people say, oh, I think Variety um, said something about the film Hole, which I think we're gonna talk about next, that um, it would feel right at home in a segment, of, uh, you know, on Oprah. And it's true, I mean, I think that sort of sensibility is what I bring to, I'm not a you know filmmaker in the classic I man film school, and I didn't do any of that stuff. So, but my background I think sort of shows through some of my films sometimes. Yeah, and in whole, I mean that. Well, let's talk a little about the premise. I mean that is sure. a story about people who are very average. I don't use the word normal, but very yeah. average in every other way, except for they have this one obsession, and that they feel that they need to have their limbs amputated. Well, usually a limb, a and, limb. A, a, and it's usually a leg and it's usually at a very specific Yes, they know location. exactly yeah. where their leg ends yeah. and where One of my favorite parts of the film. Yes. They feel like yeah. it's just extraneous and they know exactly the point. And there yeah. was one guy who says that when he did get his leg cut off, oh, yeah. that Wasn't they left exactly part of it on that shouldn't be. Yeah, he goes, it's a little bit here and a little bit there. Yeah. It's one of my favorite parts of the film. And actually it was a transition uh, moment for me in terms of wanting to continue filming because it felt like if somebody is that obsessed with that and, and they can actually feel that, then it's really real for them. I mean, it's not yeah. something that anybody's making up if you can do that. Right. I mean, they're physically healthy in every other way and whether they're mentally healthy or not is a, a question. Sure, and you, but you talk about like any perceptions. Kind of right. When I saw it at the Central Standard Film Festival, I think it was in 2003, yeah. my thought was that it was gonna be kind of some um, goth self-mutilation oh, yeah. oh, kind of... Oh, everyone thinks BME, body mod, you know, yeah. people, um, gross, bloody, you know, like, and it's so opposite of that because yeah. uh, actually for me, too, in a lot of the films, when I make them, the premise is what draws me in to make it, right? Fascinating. Who wouldn't want to know why would somebody want to be an amputee? 
right? Yeah. Well, why would somebody want to be an amputee? I had to find that out. But that is kind of the initial part of the film. But then it, later on, it delves into the relationships, what that does to relationships. It becomes right. a film about secrets and relationships, and it's kind of a love story a little bit. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff going on that is not about that. It's just about a secret and what you do when you have a secret and then you don't talk about it. Yeah, and dealing with your identity within that relationship, it was, yeah. I mean, it yeah, it's a, it's, it's a lot like a coming out film. I mean, 30 years ago, you know, people were coming out for the first time or being transgender for the first time and it was like this big, horrible thing. And, you know, yeah. now, you know, we don't even think about that anymore. But there was a sort of time period there where that was horrifying. And, I mean, I have no idea if this, is, if this will ever be a, as acceptable as that. Yeah. But, I mean, th there's a whole body of conversation that opens up from make, for making this film. We're going to talk, we're going to talk a little more about this after the clip, but can you tell us how you found this subject matter, how you came across it? Oh, you think I'm one of those, you think I'm an amputee wannabe, right? <laughs> Maybe, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> but how did you? Actually, I just, uh, a friend of mine had told me, uh, oh, she said, what are you working on now? Because I had finished Married at the Mall, she said, what are you working on now? I said, well, I don't know, I'm kind of thinking about what I'm going to do next. And she said, well, have you heard about these people who want to be an amputee? And, well, of course, I didn't believe her. I mean, would you believe it? No. Yeah. And um, she said, no, no, really. I'm like, yeah, yeah, right, I don't believe it. And of course, that night I went home and started doing internet searches and uh, found out that, yeah, there were people who wanted it, but I didn't, it was kind of in that body mod category, you know? Right. It was like, ooh, I don't know if I want to go there. But then I found a doctor uh, at Columbia University who's doing research about it, and he's the only doctor anywhere who's doing research about it. So I thought, oh, that's a good jumping off point. It. And I got in touch with him, and. Um, through him, I found uh, several people, and there was actually a convention, a uh, conference of people who got together to discuss it that was not, that happened not too, too much further after I initially contacted him. Oh, cool. So that got me into this world of, uh, there were about 25 people there, and with various reasons. Some had had amputations and some wanted one, Seeking. they were called wannabes, and um, so that's how I got started with that. Oh, interesting. Let's take a look at a clip. Sure. Kurt Boyer, the guy who, who finally became a person late in life. There we go. I carried out the contents of, of a, a lifelong obsession that my leg should be amputated. And, and I very, very methodically planned an injury with a shotgun. And, was able to uh, to do that, and I felt absolutely as if transformed. If I die in the next instant, I'm fine. I don't care. Because I have realized myself. From this age, I can remember I put my leg double in a trouser. Yes. And I don't know why I did it, but it felt good. So this was the way it's supposed to be. And this part of my leg was away. And that's what, uh, what's necessary for me. This, this part is not my part. From up to here, so it's not a part of my leg. I didn't get the choice. I mean, he knew about this when we got married, but I didn't. I think I wouldn't have married him. I'm sad that she's so narrow-minded. I see it as narrow-minded that she couldn't accept me if I needed to do that. I mean, I wouldn't marry a person that smoked, so you expect me to be happy about someone that wants something like this done? I mean, I mean maybe I am narrow-minded. I don't think it really is a deterrent against ultimately doing it. If I ultimately have to do it to be me, uh, that would come first. She doesn't have the right to tell me I can't be me. I think it's weird. You know, what, what is it that, that visits this on people? And it's peculiar. You know, it's obviously peculiar. But I've still got to do it. It's the, just knowing it's peculiar and saying it's weird doesn't do away with the problem. The problem's still there. You've got to deal with it somehow. Those were really interesting, and not even necessarily all the highlights of the film, but some interesting parts of the film. Um, 
I mean, you've shown this around quite a bit. It was on Sundance Channel, right? Mm -hmm. Any response? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the most uh, what's very fulfilling for me at, when you make films is is I mean, for years I worked only in TV, so you hardly got response. What I love is showing it in an audience, so you can have that initial like Q and A with people and discuss it. But um, because the Sundance Channel showed this, it's also been shown internationally. Um, I mean, everything from you know Sweden and Finland. I mean, I can't even remember. It's I think it's shown in over a dozen international. So I get emails from all over the world. And the what I like is that, for example, I got an email from Dan and Jenny, the couple. Dan actually has a son from a previous marriage that I didn't know about. And I got an email from his son thanking me for bringing his dad and Jenny into his living room. And the movie made him understand this so much more that he and his father are now communicating again and have established a better rapport. I mean, this is why, you know, sometimes you think about why you do the work you do, but I mean, that's a wonderful thing that happened out of this. That's kind of a I strange mean, side benefit. Isn't it? I mean, it's interesting. Have you gotten any happened. angry response? Oh, sure. Yeah, people are annoyed with me sometimes. Like, oh, you know, what about those people who, you know, uh, would do anything to have a, uh, their limbs, or their amputees, not by choice, diabetics, you know, whatever it could be. But what's fascinating to me about that is that, um, to me, people always say to me, why didn't you put them in the film? Well, I'm making documentaries now, and I'm not a journalist anymore. I don't have to tell both sides of the story. Sure. All I did is tell this side of the story. These people with this condition, that's what this film is about, them and their condition. It's obvious that people who lose a limb not by choice are gonna be mad, or that they're going to be you know, upset about the premise. So why would I put that in my film? Right. That's obvious. Can you tell us what, where we can find your films if you wanted to buy them or just see stuff online about it? Uh, you can go to my, my website is frozenfeetfilms.com. Okay. Um, www.frozenfeetfilms.com. And also through there you can be connected to each of my films. So there's a link to uh, Hole, there's a link to A Life Without Pain, um, link to Urban Explorers. Um, so you can buy the DVD on my website. So that's probably the best place to go. Right now, they're neither one of our in theaters. I think the Sundance Channel might be showing A Life Without Pain one more time uh, because it's also on that. But uh, other than that, I don't. Yeah. Can ask, you ask your local library to order it. Okay. <laughs> and go to frozenfeetfilms.com. Yeah, frozenfeetfilms. Yeah. Well, I had a great time visiting with you today. We are going it's to over? have you back. Yeah, we're going to have you back, though. I know we're doing another. We're going to do another series of interviews based oh, on the okay. on kind of the other half. Yeah, because we work. have so much more to talk about. We do. So, <laughs> thanks for having me. Yeah, though. thanks for coming in today. Okay. And to all of you out there, I want to let you know you can keep up with us at buttercity.com. Send us an email with ideas for stories or any questions or comments you might have. Thanks. Support for Butter City is provided by